Hey guys, welcome back. This is Mr. Hyatt uh, in the part three of the chapter 24 uh, lecture for AP Biology. So we pick up with 24.3 uh, here in video three, um, and we're talking about uh, essentially hybridization and um, what happens once speciation happens. Can they come back together? Um, what about the uh, incomplete reproductive barriers like the, like the mules that we talked about in the last video? Um, so there are hybrid, these things called hybrid zones. That's basically where there's overlap between two species. Um, there are these these two toad species that uh, that can interbreed. Uh, you see a picture here. We've got this yellow-bellied toad and this fire-bellied toad. And there's this hybrid zone where they interbreed. So those are our hybrids. That it, it, it's kind of a I don't know, I guess a theoretical term, um, but it's basically where the hybrids exist. Uh, so notice the zone itself is a region in uh, on the on the planet. So uh, most of these fi the fire belly toads live over here. Live over here. The yellow belly toads live over here. Where they geographically meet, there gonna, there's going to be some hybridization. Often hybrids have reduced fitness compared to the parent species. We looked at that previously, um, and so. Obviously, if, if parent species are found in patches, if, if maybe they're concentrated around uh, ponds or lakes or maybe tree stands or maybe oases in, in the desert, something along those lines, the hybrid zones can be kind of tricky. So think about how climate change affects this kind of stuff uh, or even the seasonal changes. Um, you, you, there's an example here of these uh, Carolina chickadees that have shifted northward due to climate change. Uh, mosquitoes, we know, have moved north north because of climate change. So uh, we're certainly seeing hybrid zones there as well. Um, and then flying squirrels, we've got some overlap there as well. Um, definitely lots more information on those in your book, so I would check that out if I were you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so part of the the story here is what happens when the hybrids mate with the parent species. Well now we've got some hybridization and some, some it's it, it just going to mess with the genetics. I, I think that we covered genetics enough uh, previously for this to make sense. Um, so what I, I, I know I did a poor job of explaining that, but what happens when we do that? What happens when the, the hybrids mate with the parental offspring. Well, reinforcement, you might be able to figure out what that is by the word. Fusion, you ought to be able to figure out. And then stability, <clears throat> we'll clean that one up. So let me just advance here a little bit. So we've got this population, and there's gene flow between the individuals, and then something happens. There's some sort of a barrier. Go back to the first video if you want to review those. Um, but over time, the isolated population here is going to become different. Here's our original offshoot. This should should look sort of kind of like a phylogenetic tree that you saw in Biology 1. Well, if this pink individual mates with one of these blue individuals, now we've got a hybrid zone. It's not quite pink, it's not quite blue, so it's purple. So, check out the, the arrows. Uh, basically, we're trying to trace these paths, like what's going to happen once they split. Well, if, if we get reinforcement, that's where the, the isolated population and the par parental population continue to get more and more different. They continue on their path. We're still going to get hybrids for a while, but eventually this two species become so different that they can't hybridize even. Fusion, much like it, the, the term would suggest in fusion, the hybridization is going to bring the species back together, the two species back together. Uh, and in stability, the, the hybrids are basically not going to affect the population, and the, the two populations, the two subpopulations, are going to be stable. So we'll continue to have hybrids here. We've had mules for a long time, right? So here's an example of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> some more information on uh, reinforcement. I, I deleted my example slide. Um, so when hybrids are less fit than the parents, the reinforcement happens. So uh, sometimes that's not going to be the case. Often it is. We, remember we said that hybrids are often less fit. So uh, 
see that we've got that strong selection for prezygotic barriers, so the hybridization decreases. When that happens, uh, reproductive barriers should be stronger for sympatric than allopatric species. That should make sense. Allopatric's other homeland, sympatric is same homeland. So, uh, if I can... Yep, that's that's a really good example. Make sure you check the the flycatchers out. Um, this this is I think is a really good example of uh, how mate choice plays into this hybridization stuff. I think that can be tricky. Um, so definitely make sure that you read that section. That's one that uh, is probably going to be tested on our unit test, and I would not be surprised to see this specific example on the AP exam uh, in May. When fusion happens. Essentially, what we're doing is we're weakening those reproductive barriers. So uh, we see the hybrids are as fit as the parents. So think about uh, we tend to, or maybe maybe I tend to, um, think about animals rather than plants. But think about uh, if two plants are separated, that maybe we go through a polyploid event or something along those lines, and uh, it doesn't really drastically change the phenotype. It's still a pine tree. Well, it's that that pine tree is not going to be any less fit than the parent. So perhaps we can have gene flow between the two species. Maybe the polyploid example is not a great example of that um, because then there's not going to be able to be gene flow between the species. Um, but your book talks about the uh, chicklids or the cichlids in Lake Victoria. We talked about that at the beginning of, I think, video one. Um, th that's a good example because essentially, uh, if I let me let me skip way back to. Sorry, I need to find my slide. This picture. What we see is in dry years subpopulations of chicklids become separated. Accumulate mutations, accumulate mutations. Now, I'm, I said dry year, dry stretches, dry periods. Maybe 10 years, This is these are separated. Maybe 50 years, they're separated. Then, at some point in time, we get more rainfall, and the ponds are connected. So we're going to have two subspecies. We've got bluefish and yellowfish that now Maybe they can hybridize. Maybe they are separate species. Here's the real life pictures of uh, redfish and bluefish, and they can hybridize, and they can make uh, this turbid water hybrid offspring uh, from a location with turbid. And turbid water means uh, uh, turbid is like cloudy, like uh, it's got a lot of sediment in it. So these two species hybridize, and it's going to cause fusion. So it's going to cause those two species to come back together this species and this species will cease to exist and we've got this uh, this, this hybrid species essentially uh, and then stability uh, you see they migrate into the narrow hybrid zone resulting in ongoing hybridization so we've got gene flow coming in uh, and that's going to overwhelm the selection for the in increased rep reproductive isolation uh, in that hybrid zone I think that that probably makes sense. If it doesn't, please make sure that you ask. Uh, we can spend some time talking about that in class. Uh, so 24.4, talking about the rates. You you probably learned most of this in Biology 1. We're talking about graduated, gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. So uh, the rate of speciation, we, we can study it with fossil record, morphological data, or molecular data like uh, DNA analysis. More and more, that's that's becoming our direct evidence. Uh, the fossil records suggest that punctuated equilibria happened a lot. And that's the idea that for a long time, nothing really changed. Environmental conditions stayed roughly the same, so the life on Earth stayed roughly the same. And then all of a sudden, something drastic happened. The climate changed significantly, and we went, entered an ice age. Uh, something hit the Earth and killed all the major predators on the Earth. And all of a sudden, there are these immense numbers of niches that are just available and anytime there are niches available life will diversify and life will fill those niches that's the idea behind punctuated equilibrium let's look at, at both of these pictures here 
um, on, on the same slide, and I'll kind of compare and contrast them. In punctuated equilibrium, there's uh, notice the colors. That's the whole key here. So we've got this uh, butterfly that's got a yellow band and an orange band and a brown band on the inside and a brown band on the outside. All of a sudden, conditions change drastically, so we get a fit organism here and a fit organism here. They're very different, but they evolved quickly. They quickly diverged from this uh, ancestor. And for a long time, those phenotypes stay roughly the same. Of course, there is individual variation and things along those lines, but at the population as a whole isn't changing. So you should hear that as the allele frequency isn't changing. In gradualism, instead of the quick change that we see here, we get gradual change over time. So this is kind of the old school. Uh, I've got that, that model in my, uh, in my classroom that I pointed out to you guys where the missing link idea, basically. This changes a little bit, changes a little bit, changes a little bit, changes a little bit, and then over time we get huge differences. Uh, think about Charles Lyell and, and gradualism uh, when we talked about how the, the Grand Canyon was formed and things along those lines. Um, so there is evidence that both exist. Both things happen. Uh, it, it just depends on uh, the conditions. If conditions change drastically, punctuated equilibrium is going to happen. We see that in the fossil record. Uh, and we also see that in lab studies. Uh, th there's that sunflower uh, example that you see on the screen there. Um, hybridization between two sunflower species followed by rapid speciation. So we, we can observe that. Uh, see that our range can be 4,000 years in some chicklets to 40 million years with an average of 6.5 million years. That, that's roughly how long it takes. Uh, on average, it takes 6.5 million years for one species to become two. So we would need to accelerate that to study it in the lab. Uh, so a few slides ago I talked about the fact that we can study um, genetics. Well, this is really giving us huge, specific, uh, direct evidence that this speciation stuff is happening the way that we thought it was. Uh, but think about this. How many genes does it take for those species to diverge? Is one mutation enough? Is a hundred enough? Is it where the mutation happens? Or is it, like it says here, of course it's going to be dependent on how many genes the species has in question, right? Um, so those snails, the direction of, of the shell spiral affects mating. We talked about that uh, earlier in one of the other videos. So if you get one mutation, that's enough. That's, that's a speciation event. Um, in these monkey flowers, two loci affect flower color, which influences pollinator preference. So that's going to take a few, a couple of mutations. Um, yeah, so you can see that it can lead to reproductive isolation quickly. Um, sometimes we need large numbers of genes and large number of uh, numbers of gene interactions. Um, so you, you see some some examples of these monkey flowers and the different mutations. Different pollinators are going to be attracted to those. Uh, different flowers in varying uh, levels, at, at varying levels, I guess, is, is what I'm getting at. Um, so remember that macroevolution is the cumulative effect of many speciation and extinction events. I just wanted to bring that uh, back home one last time. So that's the end of Chapter 24.